Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this event. My name is Christina Bross. I am the Associate Dean for Research and Creative Endeavors in the Purdue Honors College, and we're really pleased to have this virtual event taking place this evening. Uh, the Honors College hosts a series called How We Think. Uh, this is a, a series of roundtable discussions designed to get scholars and researchers from across the disciplines together to talk about important issues and significant research. And uh, we are especially happy to be uh, able to continue this series uh, while we are in quarantine and at a distance from one another. Um, this evening, I want to thank uh, especially the Elliott Hall of Music for helping us with our um, technical setup and thanks also to Purdue Engineering and to Discovery Park for helping us uh, s spread the word about this event and, and supporting uh, the series. Um, the outline of events tonight, uh, we'll do some introductions of our distinguished speakers. We have uh, a couple of, uh, of questions that I'll pose to the, to the speakers as part of a round table discussion. And then we're gonna move to questions and answers. Uh, as you have questions come up, please feel free to write them into the comment box and we'll relay them to the, to the panelists and we'll, we'll go from there. Um, we are recording this event tonight, uh, which will be posted later on the Honors College website and on the Honors College YouTube channel. Okay, so as I've discussed with our speakers, uh, this series, How We Think, usually takes something that we all can uh, experience together, a text, an image, a problem, um, a question, uh, that, that we can look at, that the audience can look at, and then we uh, unpack it together. Um, tonight, what we've decided should be our central focus is the pivot that we've all experienced from a time before the pandemic to our lives now. And in particular, we want to think about the pivot in our research. Um, so with that in mind, I'm going to ask each of our speakers to introduce themselves, and then we'll, we'll go from there. Uh, so Jackie, can I have you, have you start us off? Yeah, I'm Jackie Linus. I'm the Marta E. Gross Assistant Professor of Biomedical Engineering here at Purdue University. Um, my research normally consists of point of care diagnostic technologies and uh, trying to be able to test for things like cholera and HIV in the community. Thanks, um, Adib. Thanks, Chris. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, so my name is Muhammad Ali Buzaman. I'm a research scientist at the University Center for Healthcare Engineering. Uh, my primary research focus is on computational infrastructure uh, to analyze health data and also AI and art or artificial intelligence techniques uh, to develop insights from those health data. Great, I can. Ken, go ahead. I'm uh, Ken Patel. Uh, I'm from Sandia National Laboratories, but I'm stationed out here at Purdue to be the liaison for collaborative uh, research between Sandia National Laborat Laboratories and Purdue. Uh, my background is um, with the ChemBio group at Sandia working on infectious disease and emerging pathogens, but uh, provide a kind of a, a coordination between Sandia and Purdue to do collaborative research uh, for NASA security. Great, thank you. Okay, so uh, again, we're gonna, ask, we're gonna pose a couple of questions and kind of go around the table. And then the hope is that we can start to talk across the table, the virtual table as it were, and to start to include some questions from those who may be um, watching us. So the first question I wanna start with is, um, what was your research like? What was your research life like um, a year ago? So a year ago before all, all of the, the COVID-19 pandemic began, what kinds of things were you doing in your, in your research? And I don't know who wants to start with this one. Jackie, you look like you were ready to go, so I'll, I'll, I'll call on you. So for us, we were getting ready to do a field trial with one of the devices that we had to detect cholera. Um, and that was headed to Bangladesh. And then in August, we were gonna go work on, on a, deliver a device to Haiti, uh, sorry, uh, to Kenya in August. Um, to work on HIV and to see if the things that worked in the lab could actually work in the hands of some of our collaborators out there. Um, these are you, sorry, go ahead. Nucleic acid-based devices. So um, one of them is this little guy, which is a paper-based test. And um, it's got all the spots you need to add your sample. And then uh, you can let it run and it 
it separates the virus from the, the blood and it amplifies all the RNA inside the HIV and then it um, pushes everything downstream to what looks like a pregnancy test readout, mm -hmm. one line or two. Um, and it's uh, simple enough that we were hoping it could be used anywhere. So that's the type of thing we were doing before and um, we're still leveraging some of that. Okay, good, good. Um, Adib? So um, my background is, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, computer science. Uh, so what I do at our center is we try to become a hub for uh, patient health data that is being collected from different hospitals across the country or even uh, in real life scenario like for wearable devices. Uh, and for with those data sets, we create the computation infrastructure. We always do these uh, data use agreements, IRBs for each of these data sets. And then we try to make that data available uh, for our internal research as well as to uh, other researchers in Purdue's computer science, engineering, or across the whole campus. Uh, so that has been our primary focus uh, so far before uh, this pandemic. Uh, but we also focus on a lot of clinical applications, which is a specific research hypothesis that we want to test, or we ask uh, different research questions from those data. And those collaborations are also uh, based on a specific clinical area like heart failure or lung disease or uh, any specific uh, type of question that we can answer from those large electronic health records or other type of data. Okay. Yeah, and so this time year, this time last year, I was basically uh, coordinating a couple activities around uh, our hypersonics portfolio to between Purdue and uh, between Purdue and Sandia. But I think uh, this year now with the focus on COVID, we've been trying to gather the capabilities within each of the different institutions and see where there's overlap. Uh, as we've been trying to refocus some of our lab directed research towards the latest of pandemic and trying to do a rapid response to meet the immediate needs of the nation. So we've been pivoting quite a bit to, to respond in a meaningful way, whether it be new technologies or new models or adapting different models from um, other disciplines into this, uh, this um, you know, understanding how the pandemic is spreading and the, the inter interface with the diagnostic testing that's happening. Can, can, so that leads to the next question, which is, you've already anticipated it. How, how um, you know, how, what does your work look like now? And so can you talk a little bit more about how, um, how you've had to make that change or what it means? Um, is it business as usual, just with a different lens or focus, or, or have you had to make some changes? And no, I mean, so, you know, Sandia, you know, we do, you know, one of the taglines for Sandia is research in the national interest, right, or science in the national interest. And uh, we really think about problems that are facing this country and how can we drive engineered solutions to it. And typically, these are problems we care about that are further out, five to 10 years. But with the pandemic on our doorstep, um, you know, we've had to shift or pivot a little bit to, to be immediate to what we can do to help solve some of the crisis that we have. And so, you know, simple things from engineering, like can we take um, um, the ventilators and begin to help retrofit those so that they don't spew virus into the hospital, hospital atmosphere, so they become compatible with these uh, uh, class three pathogens or BSL3 pathogens. Um, are there, can we take some of our data from, or some of our algorithms from the supercomputers and the DOE national uh, supercomputer capabilities to run some of these more sophisticated models in, in quicker time so that we can be quite accurate in our predictions in improving our predictions rather than our estimates. Um, you know, so yeah, so there's a lot of uh, activity. We've got a task force at Sandia that's really focused on uh, um, bringing new capabilities to the government, their liaisons to the White House and um, to CDC that rely on some of our engineering capabilities to, to inform them. So we're really trying to pivot to how we can help in this immediate need. So we've got 10,000 PhDs, uh, PhDs that are uh, of all disciplines come together to solve this problem in a meaningful way. 
I'm thinking, okay, so for 10,000 and large scale, and, and maybe I'll go to Jackie and the small diagnostic device that you hold up and think about scale. How, how does, Jackie, for you, how does, how does your, how is, how is your work now different? So I think we haven't changed our um, platforms so much. Like we're, we're still working on devices that can be used anywhere in the world by anyone, but it's a different disease that we're trying to put on the platform. Um, so now the, the little device for HIV, we're trying to do uh, testing for saliva in blood uh, and blood that might have coronavirus, um, specifically the SARS-CoV-2 virus in it rather than HIV. Uh, uh, and I think that some of our, uh, we don't have 10,000 PhDs <laughs> in the lab. We have at most two at a time, which has totally changed our working style because my lab has 11 people in it and most of them are not allowed to be in there at all and um, now we're doing just a little at a time much more work from home much more um, I would say well thought out experiments before we jump in the lab to try them because we have more time to try them and less time to be in lab so one thing that my grad students have told me is that now they're really thinking through and they've had time to analyze and, and consider what are the best practices that they can be using, which is a definite benefit. Um, but it's quite a bit slower than we would like it to be. Um, <laughs> we've also had to think about more um, manufacturing side of things, which has been uh, fascinating because it's something we've been interested in, but never really had the connections. And now with some of the publicity around our work, we've had people reach out to us and help give us advice on how to do a really good job um, making things not just get one publication by a really dedicated grad student that can force it to work but something that can really actually be used by anybody anywhere mm -hmm. oh that's interesting and Adip, how about you how, so, how are things changed so in my case uh i was already working in a close enough domain uh, with healthcare data so in my mind, what changed most is the cultural attitude towards collaboration. Uh, and I mentioned this to you, Chris, uh, before our call the other day. Uh, so usually it takes a lot of uh, effort like uh, from our, uh, our part because we're not a medical school. So we have to convince our collaborators about the importance of the work that we are doing uh, and the data user agreements, the data sharing, that takes a lot of time. So the biggest thing that I see in my, in my mind is the cultural change around sharing data and coming everyone together. So we have created these artificial silos across different domains. Now everyone is breaking those silos and trying to do whatever they can uh, with whatever tools that they have. And I think that's a good thing uh, coming out of this pandemic. Um, the other thing I would say is uh, the pace uh, of our own research proposals and writing and uh, starting from an idea to develop a prototype that has been uh, expedited tremendously. Mm. Uh, and uh, we are also reaching out to other folks in the campus, uh, which again, usually takes a lot of time, but now we can reach out and we can work together much more easily. Uh, so that is the biggest change in my mind. I would also say that um, some of the works that we are already doing, uh, I will give an example. Let's say we are working on a project uh, for uh, identification of what treatment works for sepsis in the ICU. Now we can think about the same problem, but around COVID patients. But all we need is the same mathematical model, same data infrastructure, but a different type of understanding about the pathology and biology and the data. So we can focus our problem uh, uh, domain pretty quickly uh, based on our previous work. So that is also very interesting to watch for us to jump into those activities. So, so I'm hearing pace, I'm hearing scale. I'm also hearing, and, and this may be why, um, uh, uh, as I was thinking about, about who to invite for this panel, I was looking for researchers who I knew would be, um, had been able to make that pivot quickly. And it sounds like each of you, you know, the structures were in place and then the, pr the problem that was presented itself is slightly different. 
Um, and, I, and I think I want to come back to that. I want to invite those who are uh, tuning in and watching, if you want to start to um, pose questions to us, um, uh, please go ahead and put those in the comment box and we'll, we'll bring them up to the, to the panel as they come in. Um, I, I wanted to ask uh, maybe about time frame. When did each of you realize that there were going to be these new problems to, to tackle? Like at what point did you see um, that pivot? That, that, at what point did you realize that there was going to have to be a pivot? For us, we saw that this was a new diagnostic um, opportunity and we actually were running low on bandwidth and didn't initially want to pursue it in January and um, even early February uh, until it really became obvious that suddenly we were going to have a lot of bandwidth because we weren't going to be allowed to do anything else. Mm -hmm. and, um, but, and that we did have the expertise and the types of things that were needed uh, for this particular test. And, um, we needed to wait until there was some sort of uh, information about the, the clinical limit of detection, the viral load that you need to be able to detect so that we could see if it was something that was feasible. Mm. And as those studies started coming out, it was obvious that this is within the range of the things that we're looking at. And these are the types of samples that we can um, conceivably use at the point of care. So uh, that's sort of when we decided yeah, we, we should go for this, whether or not the funding is there yet or not. That's another question. Ken or Adib? Yeah, um, I guess if you think back a little historically, uh, you, back to 2003 with SARS and then MERS after that, and then even uh, 2000, the Ebola crisis a little bit, right? Those were really outside of the US for the most part, right? They were always a, elsewhere, we could provide support, but we were from a distance. When this really started to come on shore to our uh, to the United States and really started impacting our 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 center, whether it be in California and uh, Washington at first, and then New York, that's when it really the I think as a, as a country and as 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 a scientific uh, body of folks, we really had to pivot, right? Because now the problem was local, and it wasn't a distance problem where we can just provide support. We had to be on the front lines. Mm. So that was a pretty, I think it was a quite a bit of change for everybody from, you know, the first responders all the way to the support in research and things where the solutions couldn't take time. They had to be done quite quickly and quite immediately. And you didn't have the answers right away, or you'd had a little bit of misinformation or not all the complete data sets that you needed. So you had to do a lot of interpretation, which uh, made for a different type of science. Sorry, I'm sorry. Got a chickle in my throat. Adib. So uh, I will say uh, two different ways, the same answer. The first one is uh, as an individual in the society, I knew that I have to pivot the moment we had this pandemic. Hmm. Uh, and I started working on this on my own, uh, just figuring out what is happening around this disease, what type of data can be available out of this uh, pandemic. And I started exploring those things uh, pretty early, uh, right after a few cases uh, in China. Uh, but regarding as a researcher uh, at, at Purdue, uh, I think that happened when we started talking to our collaborators that are already working with existing projects. Mm -hmm. So everyone is now, every clinician is thinking differently. What can I do regarding COVID? So if I am working on a project on heart failure in a hospital, that physician is now working from home and his uh, patients are treating ways are different. So he's thinking about uh, how can I better serve with telehealth without actually uh, seeing the patients with, uh, but I can capture their vital signs through sensor devices. So this is just a one way of thinking that are coming and we knew that this is going to change uh, by just talking to our collaborators from different disciplines. Uh, and we also was th not thinking about the funding opportunities. Uh, we are just trying to get together uh, to solve the problem. We're getting some questions coming in through the comments on it, but I do, I do wanna uh, uh, get back to that funding question. Um, so here's a question coming in from, from someone who's tuning in. Um, what's been the biggest difficulty each of you experienced in this, in this change in your work or in this pivot? Um, is it related to uh, 
lab space uh, or access equipment or people involved or, or something else entirely? So are there roadblocks, I, I guess? Yeah, I will start with that. So uh, I said that the pace was the biggest good thing, but that was also a little bit overwhelming at the same time mm. because we are, we are not uh, tuned or accustomed to that kind of coordination at this fast pace. Uh, so for example, uh, if I want to uh, put together a clean, accurate database and that I can want to share with uh, like 100 researchers at, at Purdue, uh, usually takes hiring a graduate student and then training him for a while and then do that uh, uh, over a month, period of months. But now we have to do this uh, in a few weeks. So uh, that has been a little bit difficulty, but at the same time, uh, I personally enjoy that. Uh, so I would not say that as a difficulty uh, in this context. Hmm. There has been, I, I think, I would, guess, I would guess, well, I'll ask the other two to chime in on this as well, this sense of urgency, of course, not only because of the, the seriousness of the problem, but because things are changing so fast. How has that played out for you? Absolutely. The sense of urgency, I think I sort of went into overdrive and was like, we need to do something. We need to fix this now. We're going to get, you know, what primers do we need to design for this assay? And um, what do we need to do to get in the lab? And how does this work? Um, and about two weeks in, realized that this is not going to be solved in a very, very short period of time. And for sustainability of you know, the rest of life still going on, had to take a step back and think about, okay, well, how am I going to homeschool my kid and run the lab <laughs> and you know, deal with the lack of daycare for the other one? And um, how do I take care of my graduate students who maybe aren't in a great space right now and aren't super excited to go into the lab? Because for them, it's not a quiet place away from <laughs> screaming children. It's, it's hard and it's stressful. And so um, really had to think about like the whole, whole lab, whole self aspect of it, as opposed to just, um, you know, going in this emergency. But the, the supplies have been surprisingly not difficult. Um, we had to get some protocols to make sure that we are being very careful um, and doing extra uh, personal protective equipment and extra cleaning. And um, once we've gotten that up and running, I'm feeling pretty confident. And you're, you're just, uh, just to think about the whole picture too, and you're teaching right now too. We haven't finished our Yeah, so putting the course so. online was part of the frantic uh, right. part of, of getting things up and running and then dealing with the fact that I've never done an online course before. Mm -hmm. and my students have never signed up for online courses before. And so how do we deal across time zones and mm -hmm. making sure that everybody's okay. Can anything else to add, Ken? Do you want to chime in there? No, it's just, you know, collaboration between, say, an institute like a uh, university and a national lab is tough to begin with, right? And you've got distance, you got time zones, and it's just different. And then to throw it into this kind of a, you know, pandemic, it makes it even that much more difficult. Um, in some respects, because we're working in now from home and remotely, um, and the challenges with um, our family lives and intersecting with that, it, it, it just puts a lot of stress on, on just another burden that we haven't had a chance to really uh, work with. And mm -hmm. so we're adapting and I think people have gotten to a better stage and we've got immediate solutions. But as Jackie said, uh, thinking long-term, right? This is it's not something that's gonna get solved tomorrow. We've got to think about this. And then even if we do get to a nice level state of uh, before the, a real vaccine shows up, what is our diagnostic strategy really going to be to be sustainable, right? We got to think about the fall and the winter seasons and uh, how this really comes together. Well, so how are you thinking about sustainability? I mean, I think about this a lot, so I'd be really curious to see how you're each imagining. Yeah. Um, well, I think from, you know, obviously we need more research and some more active uh, um, solutions to some of the problems that have been apparent. Right, our I believe our diagnostic technology and our testing is still not where it needs to be hmm. for this country. And so how is that done? How is it implemented? How are the, the social implications of the contact tracing, all that's really gonna work out. So we need a really well-oiled machine to be able to go from 
diagnostics to information that can be used to treatment and therapeutics, and then, uh, you know, it interface with the entire society. And so it's, it's, a, it's a challenging problem. And so I think there's going to be a refocused effort for this nation in terms of how we do this. Um, I think the CDC, NIH, you know, the classical arms of, of federal research funds are going to now pivot as well to really think about this in the long term so that we aren't caught off guard for the future. And so what does that look like? Yeah, my is, hope is that it's long term. Say that again. My hope is that we're, that we end up thinking long term and not just a band aid. Tell us why. Tell us, talk some more about why. So if if we manage to to build these emergency tests and and get things in place and then everybody decides that I liked it better before and I you know other tests make more money because there's more. Um, cases, if we successfully cut the cut down the COVID-19 cases, then there's no reason to manufacture these types of tests or these types of um, supporting these platforms, which are probably going to be fairly resource intensive. Um, if we don't keep that up, if we let our public health system um, crumble again, then we're going to have the same problem again and history is going to repeat itself. And so I'm hoping that we'll be able to put longer term um, solutions in place. Well, so maybe this is that uh, the time to return to that question of funding, and and maybe I'll broaden that out to say resources as well. Yeah. Um, and you could either speak about your own, you know, local work, the work that you yourself are doing with your with your groups, or if you want to think more systemically, what kind of resources and funding be would you call for um, to pursue the kinds of solutions that each of you are involved with? Well. Um... I think the fundamental it is people, right? We need uh, the next generation of students and the education system to really push this as a, an area of needed want and research. But I think uh, us as educators and trainers of the next generation, we need to focus on getting the students involved in this type of research and activity. So that starts there. Um, and really highlight the problems. It's not just a, a, a medical problem or a biology type medical device problem. It's, it crosses all boundaries of disciplines, whether you're data science, mathematics, physics, chemistry, um, engineering, right? Uh, and try to make an, a, a policy. So, and so yeah. really, yeah, exactly. And, and, and so how does that all come together and uh, the appreciation of that, uh, um, it's a multidimensional problem that needs to be solved on many fronts. You know, having the best test in the world isn't going to solve it if we can't get it out to the people and mm -hmm. get the answers in a rapid way to make decisions. So we have to understand the whole ecosystem of making this a, a true diagnostic and testing so that you can do, you know, get answers on demand, essentially. So I will uh, agree with uh, Ken's point. The first thing is people uh, and be it climate change or human health uh, all of these problems need smart solutions and a lot of people working together. Uh, and I think this will allow us or incentivize uh, to work that way and also create those uh, temporary solutions and create an ecosystem of uh, different uh, uh, problems to be solved pretty quickly and the good problems, the, the problems that are being solved in the right way that will have some uh, long-term sustainable model. For example, if you think about uh, the telehealth situation, so those uh, reimbursements were not being paid by the insurance companies before. Uh, if you see a patient online or through FaceTime or Skype, but now most likely this is going to continue even after the pandemic. Uh, same with uh, non-pharmaceutical intervention modeling. So the IHME group, uh, University of Washington group, that were doing this uh, SIM model to es estimate how much uh, uh, economic uh, sacrifice we have to make by rest restricting movement, those models are not very uh, developed because people's focus was not there, the funding focus not there. Yeah. Uh, but now, 
you know, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, they spend, uh, gave a huge amount of money uh, to that group. But those things are going to sustain uh, whoever perform the best way. They will, I think, sustain long after the pandemic. So this is just a few examples, but uh, there in, in the data-driven solution, there are so many other new systems and uh, technologies that will come out of this. I'm pretty sure they will sustain in the long term. Well, and that's actually a question coming to us through chat is what, um, and I've got a couple of questions. I'm going to try to try to work my way to them. To them, uh, what will be the biggest differences in people's lives after the pandemic, or in your opinion, what will continue and sustain? And I, I know we started this conversation out by by saying something about that that more collaboration. Um, you know, maybe we may have broken down some silos that that have seemed really hard to break down in the past. Are there? Can we can we continue that line of thought? Or what are the things that you think? will be changed and won't change back? What do you think will continue either, you know, from your own perspective through your research or, or more generally? For us, I think the the translation out of the lab and in through regulatory and mm. manufacturing like that is, there's a lot of breaks in that chain um, and there's a, a lot of delays. And this has really shown um, how they, they don't have to all exist. We can get these done much faster and, uh, we can get these collaborations from sitting on a lab bench and then out the door into um, things that are manufactured and uh, regulatory approval. Uh, it, emergency youth use authorization approval is, is not full approval, and there are some issues with that as far as is it good enough. Um, but it's certainly enough to show that that we don't have to sort of sit and wait for the chicken or the egg to get um, going. We can, we can really move further. And now that we have more of these manufacturing connections, at least in my lab, those connections are gonna help us um, as we move forward in test development and design so that we can design them so that they right off the bat can be up and running. Um, and I'm, I know I've spoken to many different um, diagnostic test developers with the same mm -hmm. uh, aspects going on in their lives too. Yeah, and I, I think there's going to be um, <clears throat> there's ingenuity, and there's going to be solutions that come together, that are not from the traditional areas that we think. Um, you know, for example, we've got like car companies that are making ventilators. You know, and so when you have different people with different perspectives to attack this problem from the classical traditional folks have been uh, tasked to this, you get different solutions and different ways of looking at the problem. So I think. That'll be an interesting change to see how that comes about, where this has affected everybody in some way, shape, or form, not just to a select population. And so everybody's really adding value from thinking about how can we improve from this. And so I'm pretty optimistic that we're going to have some very radical ways of uh, uh, attacking this uh, type of scenario for the future. So I'm interested. Yeah. I I want to come back to this idea of, of, of where the traditional disciplines may be, may be breaking down, that, that we may be reaching into to, to new disciplinary knowledge, to, to realms of disciplinary knowledge that we might not have thought of before. Um, uh, I'll just say, I, I was reading that um, Germany has actually been tapping humanists and historians to think about the long, we had talked about this in a, an earlier conversation too, and I'll, the long history of pandemics uh, uh, that we know of, recorded history, and, and are there lessons that we can learn from approaches from the, those, pro not just in the last you know, decades, but even hundred centuries ago. Um, uh, and, and I think um, we're hearing people, I think, trying to push the boundaries of, of what counts as knowledge in their fields, I think, in, in some new ways. Um, I, we've got a question. Um, Maybe to bring it more more closer to home and immediate. Uh, the question is, uh, could you talk a bit about what your roles will be in enabling students to return to campus in the fall? And what do you think needs to be done uh, or should be done to make that possible? I don't know. That's a that's a challenging question for us, I think. We've been talking about the big the, the big uh, picture research. So one thing I've been doing or um, so Sandia typically has a lot of uh, Purdue interns go to mm. uh, Sandia for the summer. Unfortunately, Sandia, uh, because of the situation, has 
um, there are no student internships uh, for the summer. But what we've decided to do is try to make them virtual. And so um, really keeping the spirit of an internship and exposure to what we do in terms of research opportunities is still going to continue virtually. And so by trying to uh, engage with the students that are uh, still part of the student community, keeping that rapport together um, is something that we're, we're focused on right now is to make a meaningful experience so that they understand research and, uh, and go forward on that. And I'm teaching a design class. I'm teaching our capstone design in the fall. And um, that's the students design and they build and they test and they do this all in groups. And that's something we are definitely trying to figure out how to do um, because that group work is really critical. The, the hands-on nature is the whole point of the course. Uh, so how can we facilitate this? We've done some um, international projects where students have done more modeling focus uh, and then they've built individual things and then sort of brought them together and showed us. Um, we've done that on a small scale with like four to eight students. And um, we're gonna be spending a lot of the summer figuring out how we can do this on a larger scale and how much needs to be done remote um, if the campus does come back together. Maybe it'll be like the graduate students where we do a lot more thinking um, and planning mm before we come in, into the lab specifically, or we do a lot more prototyping with household materials, which I always encourage my students to do in the lab. Um, and now they'll actually be able to do and, and maybe forced to do it. So uh, this is actually a very good question. Um, so uh, we have been trying to coordinate with uh, defined stakeholders at Purdue, like IDSI, our uh, Safe Campus Initiative, to see how our systems and technologies can be used uh, uh, for contact tracing or uh, at a granular campus level, uh, containment and management uh, of, the, of, the, of the spread of the disease uh, in the fall. But I wish I could share more, but those are still in the plans. Uh, so we are working on those ideas. This is, so this is, I, I'm not even sure, uh, that I know exactly how I want to pose this question, but but as I'm thinking about the, the you know here we are talking about our research and we're, we're um, we've got a Cynthia Lab um, uh, person with us, but the but but the rest of us are are embedded um, um, permanently in the in this research one institution where the students are so so you know, the primary part of our mission. Um, how do we how do we want to start talking to our students about about this moment and 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 how they should be thinking about sustainability and their next steps and their reaction you know to to this are there are there things that you would encourage students to be thinking about right now to to be turning their attention to um, how how uh, robust do you think the virtual internship system is is going to be in the short term um, I'm really glad to hear that that's something that Cindy is working on. Um, it's part of the puzzle, right? I mean, it can't be the complete solution, yeah. but um, it's a, a good interim fix for the moment as a response. Mm -hmm. But I think, uh, you know, you know, things are going to change for the future, right? Um, how much of our distance and social distancing really is embedded into our the fabric of society. And so with that in mind, you know, that really extends a lot to our engagements with students and how students operate. And so working with that new paradigm is going to be important um, but still kind of conveying the principles of our you know teachings and 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 uh, uh research and you know the ability to, to think about careers for the future so um i think we'll i, I see it blending for the future uh, but uh there's nothing if nothing else uh, when and when we have face-to-face -face meetings, even the ones I supposedly dread, those are gonna be welcome, right? So hmm. having uh, engagements with students and things, we'll, I think we'll not take that for granted as much, you know, for even in classroom, right. you know, I think we'll appreciate that in a, in a better light now that we've had some of, some of these experiences and time away from our colleagues and friends. I would encourage our students to reach out 
when they need help, when they need assistance, if they're not feeling like they're a hundred percent or, or if they're struggling, because normally in my classes, I can walk around and I can talk to everybody. I can reach out. And right now we have office hours and it's kind of like waiting for somebody to show up to give Halloween candy to somebody like, hello. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I, I hear that. I, I'll just maybe say a word of my own experience. At the same time, I'm feeling as though I think because we can't be face to face, there's a there's a more collaborative attitude toward the the mm, the tasks that we're trying to accomplish. So I'm I'm just thinking about talking with my students about, you know, uh, I've set deadlines and I'm hoping we can meet them, but we all know that things aren't normal, and yeah. so and so there's a much more of a, a feedback system, I guess. I think these days, and not just with classroom. Uh, and I would love to hear if students are watching, if you're feeling um, any of this at all. Maybe maybe that's not been your experience at all. Um, but uh, you know, it's it's at least my sense that I'm in a more collaborative space than maybe I, I usually am, and I'm I am hoping to take that past this moment and with me. Um, and I'm just looking to see what what folks have been writing. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. People, people are just sort of interested in hearing your perspectives on what the what the new challenges are going to be uh, with this pivot. What do we think are going to continue to be the challenges? And I think um, maybe maybe there's a little little hint here of can you can you be prognosticators? I mean, from your do you have any sense of when the diagnostics will be more more robust and readily available, or is there any timeline that 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 the three of you can predict? Or, I won't blame you if you say no, but. I think it's a combination. Like even if we get all the diagnostics together and everybody's able to have a test that tells them something, then it comes to, you know, what do we do with that information? Hmm. Normally we focus on tests that, that enable a medical decision. So we need to be able to make a choice. And, and that choice can be, isolation or, or quarantine, um, but it would, it would be ideal if that choice was like, get a treatment. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, so back in, before I was taking this role as a liaison at Purdue, um, in my group, we tackled this problem for emerging pathogens diseases for kind of the government perspective. You know, what if the Navy ship gets completely mm -hmm. ill from a virus? How do you tell? How, you know, could, that becomes a a, 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 a concern, you know, right? Uh, or somebody who's on the front lines of our military defense, if they get sick, now they're a liability. So how do you quickly diagnose what their situation is and then take an appropriate reaction, whether it's a therapeutic or taking them back for further analysis or things like that? So I think that online or on-demand results where testing becomes ubiquitous, whether it's simple like a glucose test type analysis, a blood prick or finger prick. Um, you know, Jackie, you're, you're familiar with the, the concept of a lab laboratory on a chip, right? You know, the, the, the holy grail for this area is like the tricorder from Star Trek to, to tell you what's wrong with you. Um, and so this will start to spill over into other paradigms, you know, whether you've got a bacterial infection or viral infection, that's good to know for antibiotic resistance flu epidemics, um, potentially other uh, ailments that happen for different disease populations. So I think we're going to see this, if nothing else, this has woken us up to think about how we can use the diagnostics in a meaningful way to have the outcome both for our society, but then also individually. Um, maybe in the near term, short term, or one of the goals would be to have home, te home tests that everybody can do and they can interpret the results right away and then self-regulate on how they need to interface with society. So it's, if you, you empower yourself once you know the decision, it's not just necessarily, I don't feel so well, I'm going to go to the doctor. You can now become part of the equation to understand, well, I think I'm sick, so I'm going to stay home and not go to work or school. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to think about that for a second, because I, I, I can say, um, I didn't ask my own question about what I was doing a year ago, but I, I, I can I can imagine imagine ourselves a year ago, um, uh, and that question of self regulating if you're feeling ill. How many of us have gone to work sick <laughs> in the before time? 
uh, right? Uh, how many times have we had classes in which our students have come in and said, I, I couldn't afford to miss anymore, so I'm here. You know, I, I think that question of self-regulation is not just, a, again, it's not a matter of, and I know you all know this, you've implied it, it's not a matter of just having a test that tells us yes or no, right? Then it becomes a matter of how do we have the discussions that help us choose, do we come in or not? Do we have, you know, do we have the support we need in order to come in or not? Do we have a job that will allow us to stay home? And, mm -hmm. and, and be, you know, there's, it's such a ripple effect, right? Yep. Um, but I like this notion that, that um, of empowerment and self-regulation is, is a beautiful ideal. I don't know if anybody else wants to chime in on that, but I'm just I think many, many people are struggling with that right now. Like they, they may even know that they've been exposed and if their job Thanks. is secure, it's not before time. Then, <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then they don't feel they have a choice right. uh, for economic reasons as opposed to for health reasons. There's a lot of intertwine between the two. And the deep, I might say it also, we've been talking about the role of the individual in making that decision, but as we're thinking about aggregate data, right? We're also talking about trying to help people understand by looking at that bigger picture. Yeah, um, yeah. so exactly. So uh, I, I was thinking this from a uh, information perspective, like uh, the right information always motivates me to do the right thing. Uh, for example, if I watch my weight regularly, it's more likely I will be conscious about that, right? So how do we actually provide uh, 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 the right information with the technologies mm -hmm. uh, at the right time to the people so that those decisions, those behavioral aspects, and also the economic aspects, uh, we can make the right decision by considering all the uh, individual's choices and uh, trade-offs that one has to consider. So I think technology can help and I have a bias towards technology and data. Uh, so uh, I, I think from that perspective, that might help uh, the society in general. Okay, I've got, we're, we're, we're hoping to, to sort of end close to eight o'clock. I've got, I've got two questions that I think um, are really interesting that we, that I'd love to go around the table. One. Um, the first one is, is um, I, I think, a short question to ask, but might take a little longer to answer. What role can undergraduate students play in further COVID-19 research? You know, where are the entry points for our undergraduate students to take part in this effort? So my lab has like 13 undergrads at any given time. So you've got them. So undergraduate research in a lab is very valid. Um, I also was thinking um, that there's, just everybody wants to be able to help and do something. And many of us are feeling very helpless at the moment. Um, once I was able to get back in the lab and start writing grants and doing the, like my job towards COVID-19, I've been feeling like I can have some, some way to, to help. But many people don't have that. And um, there's, there's a lot of other ways, whether it's um, people that are, are 3D printing uh, masks and getting involved in in face shields and and uh, doing things from home, sewing and um, gowns and support masks and I think everybody wants to do something and I uh, I'm starting to see some coalescence of um, calls to action that people can reach out to. But also, um, food banks are in desperate needs and um, homeless individuals still like all of the same problems we had before are still there. And all of those ways that we can support each other in our society um, haven't gone away yet. So if we can think about holistic health issues, that would. Well, and, and you're thinking of a continuum here from, from right. you know, uh, lab research on the one end all the way down to volunteer work on the other. Yeah. Other thoughts? So I will uh, start with uh, build up on Jackie's answer. So I will say that uh, it's not only for undergrads, uh, whoever is working at whatever uh, tools, how can that tool or that knowledge might be useful in this scenario? So that's the creativity component uh, that we always are trained to think about uh, regarding research. Uh, and beyond that, uh, in, in our case, uh, the data preparation, uh, curating the data, uh, that takes a lot of effort but undergrads are actually pretty well trained to do that. Uh, but uh, we are trying to actually come up with a structure on how do we facilitate, facilitate that kind of activities 
uh, with undergrads help. And uh, they are sometimes better than graduate students. Uh, you'll be surprised. <laughs> so uh, so I, I, undergrads are very, very, uh, in many different ways they can help, uh, specifically in, in these technological solutions. Mm. Uh, great points. Uh, the only thing I can add that we is that um, different folks with different uh, backgrounds will think differently. And so there's no one right way. And I encourage undergrads, and I, I look at undergrads as really kind of, you know, they're just absorbing all this information and, you know, they don't have any pre, pre notional biases one way or the other of how this is the way it's been done. So that must be the right way. They are a blank slate. So I really encourage them and undergrads to think about out of the box ideas. That's what really makes, uh, makes this possible. And uh, you know, coming from different disciplines, you know, a software engineer talking with a biologist can have an extremely interesting conversation where uh, the exchange of information and opportunities could be very broad. So key advice would be just to, to take the areas that you really have had somewhat of a focus in, but think how it can be applied to a different area. And that crossover is really where a lot of ingenuity and innovations happen. Um, in the Honors College, we use the phrase uh, that we got from Pat Connolly in the, the Purdue Polytechnic Institute of research thinking, that we're, you know, research thinking, not necessarily research, and that that's valuable too. Although I do want to give two plugs for real pragmatic and practical um, ways to, to get involved. The Office for Undergraduate Research curates um, an ongoing list of um, opportunities for undergraduates to get involved in research, check out their webpage. And for students in the Honors College, reach out to me, uh, Dr. Christina Bross, and um, we are working to try to link up Honors College students to ongoing projects as well. So there's, there's opportunity out there. Um, we're at a huge Research One institution. And even though we're scrambling right now to sort of figure out how to, how to do our research in new ways, um, um, we're figuring it out. And there are gonna be some real opportunities, I think, for, for all kinds of people to get involved in, in the work we're, we're all doing collectively. Um, we've got a couple, couple more coming in. And, and this, I think both of the next questions are sort of imagining your, your, your work longer term. Um, and uh, one of them is, is just real concrete. How long do you expect to continue COVID-19 research? Will you continue you know, I, I guess what counts as success is it, I think you are, were alluding to that a little bit earlier, Jackie, about um, you know, not stopping too soon, right? Um, uh, what will be successful? Will you stop when others around the nation of the world achieve what you're trying to do? Um, are there other milestones that would mark a return to your original research path? And kind of uh, paired with that um, is a question from Justin Kuti. Hi, Justin. I, uh, wondering if there are parts of your jobs now that you're, what, what parts of the pivot are, are you happy about? Are there actually things that you really, you know, are looking at and saying this, this, I want this to continue in some way. Um, especially thinking, he says, about the, the tools we have to stay productive during social distancing. Um, uh, is, it, is it nice not to have to run between meetings? Uh, even that kind of basic stuff. So, so both, you know, what are you going to count as success? When, when, would you, when or if do you imagine yourselves being able to pivot back to different ways? If, if you did feel like you pivoted, and then what are the things that you really hope will persist? Those are two great questions to kind of wrap us up, I think. Yeah, big questions. Yeah, um, they are. Big, biggest for last. So uh, in terms of, you know, success or what's good, you know, it's, if nothing else, um, being at home and being forced to stay at home has allowed me to focus with my family. You know, that's the central unit, which uh, you, you would never get that opportunity in, say, a, a last in a, in a former year or something like that. You know, because we're running around, flying around, you know, lots of travel. That has changed kind of some of the priorities, if nothing else. Um, how you focus on kids, how they are viewing this and recognizing the, the population that really need, need, needs help. So how, how do we do that? So that's been kind of uh, interesting to see how that's gonna, that'll continue, I think, for me for the future. Um, in terms of uh, where I see the future going, um, 
it's interesting. It's so dynamic. You know, even a month ago was so different than today. So I expect the next month to be just as different. So it's nice to see we're seeing rapid change. I'm, you know, I think it's, it's tough and it's hard for everybody, but uh, it keeps everybody focused and honest, if nothing else. And uh, a lot of little petty things do not get in the way because we're, we're all kind of on an equal footing in some respects. So uh, in, in my case, uh, a pivot in my mind is not the topic itself, but how we think about a problem, how we work together. So I hope that this will not end after this pandemic, and this will continue in the long term. Uh, in terms of um, the sustainability and the big picture after the pandemic, how we actually work in this environment, uh, I think um, the, there will be big technological solutions that would continue long after the pandemic. And that is just the beginning of those solutions that we are coming to see right now. And I'm very excited about those opportunities and those times. Deep, sorry, are you talking, can you give us a couple, maybe an example of, of, of that kind of big technological solution that you, you think is being um, yeah. investigated now that you hope would persist? Right, so uh, just giving an example around testing. Mm -hmm. So right now, uh, you can actually um, see how many testing is done, how many numbers of positive, what are the demographics, almost real time from the entire country. And that technological platform, uh, even though it's not publicly available for everyone, has been created out of this pandemic. And that is an exciting opportunity for future, for the future. Thanks. Jackie, you wanna take a stab um, at this, these? On the success front, I think success would be that um, our platform in the short term that our platforms are able to perform and and we're able to get them out into the world and people are using them. Um, generally, that's our milestone for success and that they're easy to use for people. Um, I don't think that just because other people have also succeeded in making a lot of tests that are also successful. That's a problem because there's a whole lot of the world. Um, to, the U.S. is one place, we're working with collaborators in South America, in Africa, and the tests that they need are probably going to look very similar uh, to what we're doing. And so I don't think that we're going to have a, a shortage or a, a, a dearth of tests at any point. Um, so there's, there's plenty of space for everyone in, in many different um, technologies that can fit into these diagnostic tests. In the long term, success to me would look like the next pandemic that comes by, we're actually ready for it. Mm. And we are able to stop it before it gets anywhere near this point. Um, and as far as things that I'd like to keep, um, my kids are living their best life. They're having a great time. They're <laughs> young and they don't really know yet. Um, and so I try and keep that in mind. Uh, I'd like to keep the the momentum going, like Adib said, as far as the collaborations and the silos that have been uh, cut down. And I'd like to keep the, the interaction with the students. Uh, you had mentioned that the, the feedback loop is actually going pretty well. And, and that openness, I, I really appreciated in our online um, switch as things that weren't working, people are able to tell me and I can adapt to that. And um, I, I really appreciate that. And I wanna be able to do that in the fall and in coming courses to get that interim feedback to make sure that we're doing a good job for all the people that are our, our stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great, I think a really wonderful note to end on. Um, I wanna thank um, all three of you for, for trying out this experimental um, format for the evening. Um, thanks to those who were watching live and who posted questions. Uh, it's our first stab at trying to um, have one of our, our how we think forums online and the feedback loop, loop, feedback loop is really important, I think, for this event as well. Um, and thanks for all the, the folks who've helped to, to put this together and make it, um, make it happen, uh, especially to the Elliott Hall of Music for um, running our tech for us. And I was really especially happy that we were able to have closed caption, uh, or captioning going as, as we were speaking tonight. So thank you as well. Good night, everyone. Stay safe. Wash your hands. Thank you. Thank you.
拜拜。